Bismillahir Rahmanir Rahim. This is Chapter Ten, Five Zero Nine Zero O Level Biology, and we are going to we're going to try and uh, finish this uh, chapter uh, in this video. But if it's something is left over, then we'll continue it in the next video. Now, as we look at the syllabus, uh, this ten point one, ten point two, and three. Uh, first, to describe respiration, chemical reactions, release energy from glucose. Then uses of energy, we talked about this in detail. Then investigate, we'll do this right at the end. Then aerobic respiration, the word equation, and a balanced chemical equation. Then in anaerobic respiration, uh, we do the release of small amount of energy. Then word equation, word equation. So there's no chemical equation here. And then why lactic acid builds up and what is oxygen debt. Another very good habit is to revise the chapter from the book or from your notes or from anything that you want to study from, or your teacher's notes. And then at the end of it, when you revised it, then you go through the entire syllabus and see have you covered all the points, and do you know all the points? And of course, if you're taking the exam in 2023, then you look at the syllabus for 2023. Don't look at a previous syllabus because that would be a mistake. That's what sometimes you do. You make a mistake of that. So please go to the right syllabus of the year in which you are taking the exam. Now, as we go through the equation, uh, this would be the word equation. The word equation is glucose plus oxygen gives you carbon dioxide plus water plus energy, which is released. And the uh, chemical equation would be C6H12O6. Please remember this has to be uh, balanced. So chemical equation would be C6H12O6 plus 6O2. It uh, gives you six CO2 and six H2O. Please remember, uh, we will need enzymes for this reaction, which we don't write in it, but I just want you to remember it that enzymes will be needed for this reaction. Another simple way to write the word equation and the chemical equation. So if you find this one more easier, you can pause the video here and have a look at it, and please memorize it. Then anaerobic respiration equation. Now I told you that we don't need the chemical equation, but what we need is that glucose. So there's no oxygen here because it's anaerobic. So glucose is broken down to lactic acid and energy is released. That's it. Where in lactic acid in the human muscle when we are exercising and when we are doing some strenuous exercise, in the yeast which is called alcoholic fermentation. We only have the glucose molecule is broken down. So here also you have glucose. Here also you have glucose. And here instead of lactic acid, here you have ethanol. So the ethanol is the important. You don't have to remember the chemistry of it. So ethanol plus carbon dioxide and energy. So energy is also less than, but it's a little less than the aerobic. But of course, it is a little more than the lactic acid fermentation. So glucose gives you ethanol plus carbon dioxide. Here glucose gives you lactic acid and energy. So energy is common to both of them. Now the first point of the syllabus is describe respiration. So what is respiration? Number one, it's chemical reactions in all living cells. So living cells means what? Living cells means bacteria. Please remember, bacteria has no mitochondria, but they respire. Fungus. Animals, plants, but what does not respire? Virus does not respire. So chemical reactions in all living cells, bacteria, fungus, animal, plants, that release energy. Now you see how I've underlined this in red. Release, R E S, respiration, R E release. So R E is common. And what you write, which is very very wrong, is that you write produce energy. Produce energy is wrong because energy cannot be created or destroyed. This is some law of thermodynamics. I don't know a lot of physics, but I know this is that energy cannot be uh, created or destroyed. So, produce energy is wrong, and you write a lot of this in your uh, mark scheme. So we, we you write a lot of these in your papers because we then get this information from the examiner's report, which tells us teachers that you know students wrote that. And that is wrong. That is a reject in uh, any of the mark schemes if you look at that. And what is your body fuel? Your body fuel is glucose. So basically, I have broken up the uh, definition of respiration. Number one, it's chemical reactions. Number two, it occurs in all living cells, and it releases energy. And the fuel is glucose. Like if you have cars, cars run on combustion. Now that's not respiration. It's uh, respiration can be compared to combustion. And the fuel there is fossil fuel, like petrol or diesel. 
but here the fuel is glucose here what we can only respire the living organisms can only respire is glucose next point that we need to discuss is uses of energy in the living organism it's living organism not humans it didn't say humans it didn't say plants in the syllabus it says living organisms so muscle contraction of course occurs in humans and in certain other animals as well then protein synthesis cell division growth active transport the passage of nerve impulses and the maintenance of body temperature now these are seven and you should make a mnemonic out of this and see if you can make some mnemonic out of it and remember it so muscle contraction protein synthesis cell division growth active transport nerve impulse the passage of a nerve impulse and body temperature now let's look at the first one now here are the different examples that I've come up with for muscle contraction because when it comes in the MCQ and you're going to not figure that out, you'll forget it. So peristalsis is muscle contraction, inhaling, exhaling is muscle contraction. Pupil constricts the muscles, their radial muscles and circular muscles of the iris. They contract and the pupil becomes wider or becomes constricts or you can say the pupil dilates. Then sphincter muscles contract and relax. We have the anal sphincter. Then vasoconstriction and vasodilation is what? Muscles in the wall of the arteries. So muscles in the wall of the arteries contract or relax. Now, of course, we are talking of muscle here. So all these are examples of muscle contraction. Now, in this, the first example was energy is needed in living organisms for muscle contraction. And these are the points that you must remember. So if they say energy is needed for peristalsis and you say, oh, no, God, no, not peristalsis, it said muscle contraction. And you're not going to correlate peristalsis with muscle contraction. Well, then you're going to miss out that MCQ. Then the second point it said uses of energy was number two was protein synthesis. Now, when we say protein, I mean, it should immediately come to your mind. Pepsin is an enzyme. It's a protein. Amylase is an enzyme. It's a protein. Lipase is an enzyme. It's a protein. So pepsin produced in the stomach wall. Amylase are produced by the pancreas and the salivary glands. Lipase produced by the pancreas. Then hemoglobin is produced in the bone marrow where the red blood cells are being formed. And the hemoglobin is inside the red blood cells. Then myoglobin, which is found in muscles. Then insulin is a hormone produced in the beta cells of the pancreas and antibodies are produced by lymphocytes. Now, these are all examples of protein synthesis. Then the next uh, two that I'm discussing together is the number three is cell division and number four is growth. Now, why are they two different points? You see, growth is a permanent increase in dry mass. A permanent increase in dry mass. We don't talk about dry mass a lot in this uh, syllabus, but Dry mass is the total organic matter in any organism. Like if you take an apple and it's 10 grams and then you uh, put it in an oven at 100 degrees Celsius, then 10 grams becomes 5 grams because all the water has evaporated. So 5 grams is the dry mass. So growth is permanent increase in dry mass. So that means new cells have been added, new cell wall, new cell membrane and all that. Now cell division is anything cells divide to replace worn out cells so that is also mitosis in growth also there is mitosis so cell division occurs in both the situations but in one what is happening is that the cells are being replaced so new red blood cells are formed because red blood cells die every day now there is that's not going to be an increase in mass why because say 1 million cells red blood cells died today new red blood cells have been formed which are going to replace those red blood cells so cell division and growth like cell division will occur even during repair when bodies became repairing then also cell division is going to take place so that's why this is two separate categories that we are talking about and the next example of uses of energy is active transport. And that, of course, because we are discussing active transport in living organisms. So root hair cells, ions are taken up by active transport, which means that it requires energy. Energy means respiration has to take place. And this respiration can be aerobic or anaerobic. So it can be either aerobic or anaerobic and energy will be released. And the second example that I've given you is intestine, where the glucose and the amino acids are absorbed and they enter the bloodstream. 
so that is again by active transport then uh, next point is passage of nerve impulse now the passage of nerve impulse results and we uh, touch something hot and we withdraw our uh, hand immediately we say oh my god that's very hot now that is because all motor neurons supply muscles and glands and these are the effectors and they are at the ends of the motor neurons so all those actions which are going to result in the muscles contracting or the glands producing a secretion so like for instance i remember one mcq in which they said uh, the production of insulin by the pancreas yes because the pancreas is a gland and the production of insulin and the production of insulin is a protein so that would require a nerve impulse which would make the pancreas release first of all produce insulin also requires energy and release the insulin into the blood stream so passage of nerve impulses are of course sensory information is also passage of nerve impulses like when you touch something hot how did you know this is hot you have receptors in the skin which are stimulated and that generates an electrical impulse and that electrical impulse enters the spinal cord and then of course the brain is informed so you will talk about a lot of this a lot of this in the coordination chapter now the last point point for which we need energy is the maintenance of body temperature now i give you a very simple example i say what if i give you a beaker full of water and i say okay keep this at 37 degrees celsius now what will you ask me for you say okay miss give me a bunsen burner and then you will place the bunsen burner under it and you will say okay miss now i'll keep it at 37 degrees celsius so what is that bunsen burner in your body is a process of aerobic respiration now aerobic respiration is releasing heat and it's a series of chemical reactions and that heat is going to maintain your body temperature at 37 degrees celsius like for instance if i remove this bunsen burner this water will cool down very soon to room temperature whatever the room temperature is but your and my body temperature even this room is cold or if it's hot your and my body temperature will always remain at 37 now what is that why is that because every cell in every cell of your body there is aerobic respiration taking place inside the mitochondria so the mitochondria are acting like the bunsen burner and you have mitochondria in every cell of your body except in red blood cells you don't have any mitochondria but then part of the respiration also takes place in the cytoplasm because you have to remember is even bacteria do not have mitochondria but they respire and i said this earlier in the video that bacteria respire and bacteria do not have any mitochondria now if you have to compare aerobic and anaerobic respiration you can see the reactants are what in aerobic it in anaerobic it is only glucose in aerobic it is glucose and oxygen combustion is incomplete it is complete energy yield is very little 2 atp here it is 36 to 38 atp products in animals it is lactic acid in yeast it is ethanol and carbon dioxide in aerobic respiration it is carbon dioxide and water now location anaerobic takes place in the cytoplasm aerobic takes place in the cytoplasm and the mitochondrion of course these stages glycolysis and fermentation glycolysis link reaction this of course a little bit of the a levels so i'm not going to be talking about that uh, now let's talk about the production of lactic acid in the anaerobic respiration uh, now whenever a person is doing a vigorous exercise the supply of oxygen is a limiting factor you see he has a fixed number of red blood cells and he has a fixed uh, mass of hemoglobin in the red blood cells so the supply of oxygen becomes a limiting factor because more oxygen is needed the demand is more because now the person is doing vigorous exercise like running a 100 meter sprint or any vigorous exercise on an incline in the treadmill now demand is more but the glucose plus oxygen gives you 38 atp without oxygen the glucose will still give you 2 atp but it will produce lactic acid so the person is able to run the 100 meter sprint which is a very short stint but a very vigorous exercise so he or she still gets this 2 atp because without oxygen 
first of course the oxygen is providing it the 38 atp but still the, the person needs more atp that is provided by the anaerobic respiration but the problem is that you know this results in lactic acid lactic acid will result in muscle cramps because lactic acid lowers the ph and the person is going to have problem is going to have pain in the muscles and the muscles are going to cramp and he's going to stop exercising but of course athletes can tolerate very high levels of lactic acid they have of course stamina training by which they can tolerate large uh, large amounts of lactic acid now after the exercise ends the lactic acid builds up in the muscle cells diffuses into the blood now it is taken to the liver and in the liver what is going to happen it is going to be converted back to something which is called pyruvate or you can think even glucose and then that glucose will be respired to release the rest of the energy which it still contains because only 2 atp have been formed so there's still 36 atp to be still generated from it now this requires extra oxygen so the deeper breathing continues even after the exercise now in your new syllabus you have this word mentioned it says excess post exercise oxygen consumption which has been labeled as epoc or in other words is called the oxygen debt now how is that oxygen debt going to be repaid debt means uh, you ask for a loan uh, in urdu we say qarza so oxygen debt now the faster heart rate continues but why does that continue even you've stopped exercising but the faster heart rate your heart rate is still fast 120 per minute normal is 72 to 80 per minute why because the faster circulation means that the lactic acid which was found in the muscles can be then taken to the liver taken to the liver so the lactic acid which was formed in the muscles you see you have to remember is the heart rate which is faster means that the circulation is faster so when the circulation is faster so the muscles are going to throw the lactic acid into the blood the muscle cells they are going to diffuse the lactic acid is going to diffuse into the blood and then it has to be carried so the veins will carry it to the heart and then back and then of course it will go to the hepatic artery and then it will end up in the liver so if the circulation is faster then it will take lesser time say normally it took 20 seconds now it will take 10 seconds or maybe even 5 seconds to reach the liver so the liver is going to now convert it back into glucose and then it's going to be respired so lactic acid needs to be removed needs to be removed from the muscle and taken to the liver the next thing which has to happen is the deeper and faster breathing continues so even though you have stopped exercising but you still keep on breathing deeper and faster so though your heart your breathing rate is faster and you're taking deeper breaths why because this is supplying that extra oxygen which is needed to break down the lactic acid that was the oxygen debt which you had incurred so extra oxygen is needed to break down that lactic acid because lactic acid will then be aerobically respired and the energy will be released and we need this energy we can't just say okay remove the lactic acid pass it out in the urine or in the feces or something like that so lactic acid has to be converted back into glucose and then the glucose is respired i'm just telling it to you that's not actually the technical way the technical way it's you know glucose to pyruvate and pyruvate to lactate and then lactate goes back to pyruvate and then the pyruvate is respired so that's if you want to know the uh, the uh, details of it which we do in a levels now coming to the last topic which is left of this chapter is investigate and describe the effect of temperature on respiration in yeast now when it says investigate then we have to know some sort of a practical what are the practical that we are going to do in the lab whenever there is an investigate you have to understand that it is laboratory work you must know this lab work because this is going to come in your atp paper which is the paper 4 which used to be the paper 6 but now it is paper 4 so this is one of the very simple practicals that i'm going to be talking about make some bread dough using flour water and activated yeast in warm sugar solution why because yeast has got enzymes so it's got to be activated so the enzymes have to start working which are present in the yeast rub the inside of a boiling tube with oil this makes it easier to remove the dough after the experiment use a glass rod or the end of an old pencil to push a piece of dough so you're pushing this piece of dough into this 
so that the tube is about a quarter full of dough. Use a glass rod at the end of an old pencil to push a piece of dough into the bottom of the boiling tube so that the tube is about a quarter full of dough. Mark the height of the top of the dough. So you mark the height of the top of the dough. Mark the height of the top of the dough on the boiling tube using a china graph pencil or a permanent marker pen. Now you place the boiling tube into a beaker of water. Now you place this in the beaker of water. So this has got a beaker of water. You place this in a beaker of water set to a pre-selected temperature of say 20 degrees Celsius. Now leave the dough for 20 minutes. Checking to make sure the temperature of the water bath remains constant. Either you use a thermostatically controlled water bath or you use just this ordinary and you keep on adding a little bit of hot water to it. Record the new height of the dough after two minutes. So this is probably, the dough has probably risen to a certain height. So it's come up to here. Now you can see the how the difference in the height of the dough. So record the new height of the dough. Repeat the procedure at different temperatures and compare the rate of rising of the bread dough. So you would do this experiment at 20 degrees, then you would do it at 30 degrees Celsius, then you would do it at 40 degrees Celsius, and then you would do it at 40, 50 degrees Celsius. So you can take this or you can say, no, well, I don't want to take these temperatures. You can take different temperatures. You can take 25 degrees Celsius. You can take 30 degrees Celsius and then 35 degrees Celsius. And 40 degrees. You can, I usually suggest that you take five different temperatures. Now the different temperature means that the what are we studying? We started studying yeast enzyme reactions. We are studying yeast respiration. So basically the yeast is respiring and carbon dioxide is being produced which is making the dough rise. So when you're going to increase the temperatures what is going to happen? The kinetic energy is going to increase. So more enzyme substrate complexes form, more product formed per unit time. So the yeast respiration is going to, the rate is going to increase. So when you increase the temperatures, this height is going to become more or less. So at 25, the height was whatever, at 30 will be slightly more. But then of course, we have to remember the optimum temperature of an enzyme. And if the temperature is above the optimum, then it will denature the enzyme. And then of course, the height will maybe drop even. So this is a very easy way. Results, the dough rises faster as the temperatures increase from 35 or 40. Higher temperatures slow down the rate. Low temperatures may result in no change in the height of the dough. Explanation, yeast respires anaerobically producing carbon dioxide. This causes the dough to rise. The process is controlled by enzymes which work faster as the temperatures increase to the optimum around 35 to 40. Higher temperatures cause the enzyme to denature. So this was the experiment that I wanted to talk to you about the effect of temperature on yeast respiration. Uh, another method to study um, the rate of transpiration can all this rate of uh, sorry yeast cellular respiration uh, can also be that you connect this like a flask and you have the yeast in that and you can keep these at different temperatures. And then you can see the uh, how the volume of the balloons changes because as more carbon dioxide will be produced as more temperature is increased. So you can also do this as another way that you could also do that is then to measure the volume of the carbon dioxide. So that is going to collect in the balloon. And this of course would be that you'd have to keep the yeast sugar mass the same, the volume of the yeast sugar solution the same, but then you'd be changing the temperature. And that would give you a very good idea about how temperature affects the yeast cellular respiration. Uh, then another way that you could do is another experiment can also be done. You see this stained water drop is going to move this way. Because as carbon dioxide is being produced, that is going to push the uh, stained water drop uh, towards the right. So how far does it move? The length of the column that it moves is going to tell you the uh, how much carbon dioxide is being produced. So you could do this at different temperatures and also study the rate of uh, yeast respiration. Uh, this completes your chapter 10 and thank you for watching and uh, we will be continuing with the other uh, chapters which are left for the new syllabus which is uh, being examined from 2023 onwards.